Aloha golfers! Welcome to Golf in the Cosmos, episode 34. I'm Kevin Robowski, and here we talk all things Mac O'Grady and Morad. So I get asked frequently what it was like working with Mac O'Grady very closely for 12, 13 years like we did. Um, doing the golf schools with him, taking lessons, uh, spending a lot of time uh, with even tour pros, and it was a great experience overall. But it was quite unpredictable. And to share a quick story with you, to demonstrate that, um, in the 90s, uh, Mac would come to Hawaii and do the Monday qualifying for the Sony Open. And the Aloha section, PGA, ran that event, and they would pair me with Mac uh, to sort of keep an eye on him, make sure he didn't get into too much confrontation. And uh, so one year, probably in the mid-90s, uh, I drove to Mac's uh, hotel uh, Monday morning, five, probably 5.30 a.m., because we had an early starting time. And if I was there at 5.31, Mac might never talk to me again. So these things, very important to be punctual with Mac. And, uh, but I get to the hotel parking lot and I see Mac and uh, he's next to his car and he's locked out of his car. So his car keys are in his golf bag. His golf bag is in the trunk of the car and the car is locked. And so in these days, there was no GPS, no sort of way to electronically use uh, something to open the car. And so we had to call a locksmith and about 45 minutes later, the locksmith shows up and we get the car uh, trunk open and we drive together to the golf course. And we get to the golf course about five minutes before our starting time. And uh, so we jump on a cart go to the first tee and uh, you know we're all set to tee off. It's probably the only time in my golfing career I played around a, a competitive round without hitting one practice shot. No putt, no, no, no uh, range ball, no nothing. Just uh, right to the first tee. And uh, so we get to the first tee and this tee box is not used by the club very often. It's kind of set back. It's a very small tee box and uh, on a hill and uh, we mac and i are playing together we're playing from with two pros from the mainland and uh, they announce us the the pro from the mainland is ready to tee off and uh, puts his tee in the ground and mac had a habit of standing quite close to you when you teed off uh, or when you even just hit a ball from the fairway now, I was accustomed to that, and you know, uh, we had familiarity, so it didn't bother me. But you know, for someone that wasn't uh, you know, that close to Mac, uh, that could be somewhat disconcerting. So Mac stands quite close to this pro's ball, maybe like about mm, two feet, and, uh, and the pro backs off. So he says, uh, excuse me, Mac, do you mind? Um, you're standing a little too close to my ball. Uh, I need you to move off a little bit. And Mac responds, are you angry at me? And the guy goes, no, Mac, I'm, I'm not angry at you. I, I just need you to move back. And Mac says, it sounds like you're angry at me, and I really don't appreciate that attitude on the first hole. And the guy goes, come on, Mac, give me a break. I'm just trying to tee off, and you're standing too close to me. And Mac takes a few steps back, just puts his hands across his chest, doesn't say anything. We all proceed to tee off, and, uh, and Mac stays silent for 18 holes. Doesn't say one word to anybody, including me, and we're driving the car together. Uh, I remember uh, maybe we were on the 12th hole, and uh, Mac hit a ball in the left rough, and there was some trees, and well, he had to carry over a bunker, and a short-sided pin, and uh, elevated green, and green runs away, and he hit a very nice shot. And uh, maybe like from that position, you know, maybe he hit it 20 feet from the hole. And I, and I said, good shot, Mac. 
and he turned at me and he gave me such a, a mean look, right? And uh, didn't say a word. And <laughs> I was like, oh boy, you know, I'm in trouble now for saying good shot. But, uh, you know, and even on, I remember on that round on the 17th hole, it was a par five and uh, I hit two good shots. Uh, I hit my second shot actually near the green, but uh, stymied in a bush. And I had took out a, a wedge and I turned it upside down. And from about 50 yards, I knocked the ball out of the bush left-handed and hit it on the green to about four feet and I made the putt for birdie. And Max still didn't say anything to me. So we finished the round. Surprisingly, Mac and I both played pretty well. I shot, I think, uh, one under par that day, and Mac shot, I think, two under par. And it would take like 68 usually back then to, to qualify or to, or to get into that last spot. And uh, so we didn't qualify. And uh, so we go back to Mac's car. Mac drops me off at my house. Doesn't say a word the entire um, the entire car ride. I get out. I say thanks, Mac. Bye. He drives off to the airport, back to Palm Springs, California, and uh, and I did not hear anything from Mac for one year. And the next time I heard from Mac was when he called me up to enter him in the next year's qualifier for the Sony Open <laughs> a year later, and uh, so. Mac would have you on pins and needles, for sure. So, but, uh, you know, that was also part of the fun, part of the, the part of the, of the relationship with Mac, it was uh, the, some of the eccentricities. So, definitely um, was an interesting time. Today's video is also quite interesting. It's a later version of Mac and his swing theories. And this video, he's explaining his reasoning from going from low hands, which he played his career, and that was a staple of the Morad swing, which was very low hands, and, uh, and then gravitating to the higher hands. So the hands more uh, up, shaft angle higher. And so these are some of the, the reasons that he goes and explains why he did this. And uh, although I, I'm a little bit dissatisfied with this video in the sense of his reasoning and some of his logic, um, just to um, give you some background, Mac liked the low hands for um, you know probably a decade. And it was part of the Morad research. A lot of it had to do with the grip so putting the golf club more in the fingers or in the metacarpal bones of the left hand, right? That's gonna make your left hand grip a little more rotated, 45 degrees, and it's also gonna lower your hand positioning, right? So just having the hand more in the metacarpal bones is gonna uh, have uh, a correlation to your hand position, right? Whether it's low or high. So if I had my hands in these the fingers like such and I start to uncock my wrist like this and raise the hands this puts a lot of stress on my hand so when you hold the club in your fingers it wants to have it you should feel this lever right you should feel this angle like a little bit of a pre-cock right here and then that's what this what makes it feel very comfortable so um, and again you know trying to eliminate rotation, forearm rotation, club face rotation, trying to um, keep the club level through the ball, almost return the shaft as much as possible back to the original angle. This is all part of the original Morad idea and uh, again stems very importantly from for uh, to have low hands. And I started to see this in the early 2000s where I saw Max's left hand start to get weaker. So um, you, know, you look at the 86, 87 video, Max got that sucker over there big time. And he, he's got it way in the, the pad of the left hand is way over the shaft, right? So he's got it really in the fingers, really in the metacarpal bones. And that's where you're gonna get the maximum wrist cock, right? So, uh, and keep the club face square. 
right? So you could have dorsiflexion in the left wrist, right? And keep the club face square and have maximum wrist angle. So Mac talked about having 135 degree wrist angle at P5, right? Why? You're gonna get maximum power, maximum club head speed. And so the, the big problem when you usually dorsiflex your left wrist is that it opens the club face. But not if you have it over here turned 45 degrees and in, and in the metacarpal bones. So this is the whole point, is that the blueprint of the Morad swing was really stemming from address, and a big component of that address was the grip, right? Keeping that club in the metacarpal bones of the left hand, right? That's gonna naturally put your hands in a lower position and give you the maximum cocking and recocking action, which is gonna create club head speed, and you don't have to worry about opening the face. In fact, in this generation, 86, 87, he was somewhat negative about Homer Kelly, the golfing machine. He would, he would say it's forbidden to play with a flat left wrist, right? Forbidden, right? Why? Because it promotes forearm rotation, it raises the hands at address, creates a higher center of gravity, puts, it creates the, um, the grip more in the palm, and um, and these things are, are mechanically and anatomically at a disadvantage, right? It's not to say you can't play that way, but it's harder on the brain to repeat a simple movement, right? And uh, so if you have a lot of club face rotation and this, you know, in this higher center of gravity position. So uh, Mac did not like the flat left wrist, you know, limit also limited, limits wrist cock right, and tends to get the shaft to point to the left at the top. So Mac at P4, he would prefer more down the line. And of course, if you turn your shoulders exactly 90 degrees, the club would be exactly down the line at P4, which is usually about, about a five iron, right, for Mac back then. Now, as you turn the shoulders more, let's say 110 degrees with the driver, the shaft would get slightly crossing. So if you look at Max photos in 86, 87, with the driver, the shaft slightly crossing the line. But that's still, he has the 90 degree relationship between the shoulder turn and the shaft angle, right? He's just turning his shoulders more than 90. Right? So just to clarify that, right? And so, yeah, it's uh, something that uh, definitely uh, Max started to change in the 2000s, right? So he started to go back to the Homer Kelly idea, flat left wrist, more on an inclined plane. So at the top, the shaft was more laid off looking, more pointing to the left, left wrist very flat. So Mac is talking about in this video, which is so ironic, is to have the hands up higher, which is definitely going to promote a weaker grip, um, a grip more in the palm. Although he's saying you still stay with a strong grip, it wasn't as strong, for sure. Didn't have that thing over in his fingers like uh, like he did in the 80s. So higher left hand, right, and of course you're going to have a higher right hand. Uh, and what he's saying now is from this position, just flatten the left wrist. P1 to P2, keep it flat, P4, and then come right back down. The club face is always square, right? This is exactly what the book Square to Square promoted in the 70s, right? The square to square method, right? Flat left wrist at address, flat left wrist takeaway, flat left wrist at the top, uh, higher hands, uncocked, and, uh, and that was the method. And the crazy thing is in, in the 80s, 86, 87 Mac, he hated this idea. I mean, this was a violation of all the scientific effort he put into with his quote unquote research. And so interesting how our minds and our brains are, uh, the, we change, right? We change our opinion. And so uh, Mac in this video that's coming up, is going to be saying uh, towards the end, this is the best he's ever hit the ball, right? And he's dealing with an elbow injury. I think Mac fell uh, while he was running. He broke his elbow at this period, so he can't hit a golf ball. And uh, so he's a little bummed out about that. But that that was temporary. And uh, But 
yeah, he's adamant that this is the best that he's struck the golf ball. Now, I would say that the best you strike a golf ball is going to really be somewhat, uh, if you're looking at, you know, I would say a little more research based, your performance at the highest level, right? So Mac in 86, 87, he won on the PGA Tour uh, and he won with sort of poor putting. And uh, so that's a, that's a, that in itself is a testament of his ball striking ability. And I, and I do think that people in the 90s and the 2000s that did go to Mac for golf instruction and golf schools, they, at least originally, they, they wanted to have that 86-87 look, right? Which stemmed from the low hands, crouching position, and a lot of speed, a lot of simplicity, just turning around a centered axis, keeping the arms close, keeping the gaze down, and a little more of the spinning top. Now, some of these ideas Max still stayed with, uh, for sure, and kind of mixed and matched you know, different uh, concepts from the 80s and the late 2000s with the golfing machine stuff. Um, so it's very interesting to watch some uh, videos of golf schools that he did in the 2000s because it seems to be somewhat dependent upon his, you know, his mood uh, as to what characteristics that he taught. So, uh, but this video is very interesting because it will explain exactly why Mac went from low hands to higher hands. And again, that was a shift maybe from the original Morad ideas, which he worked with Gary McCord and Zavid Manjakian, and, uh, and then almost returning back to his roots with Homer Kelly and the golfing machine. So anyway, please enjoy the video and uh, we'll see you soon for our next segment. Aloha. My hands, like here, as such. Here, this is flat and that's square. This just stays flat, square, and come right back up to half. If it's too low, then you should run into some problem. Watch. The driver. Do this. Go back by the camera. Do this. Looks like Hogan, dude. Excuse me? Looks like Hogan. You got it. Wow. Excuse me? When, when did you start changing that, Mac? Because uh, when you were on tour, you, you, your hands were low? My, I, my hands were not much lower, like Johnny Miller and those guys. Yeah. But with the longer clubs, you can get them up. Okay. The shorter clubs, you're okay. You can, now, on the other side of the point is, what, I'll discuss it, I'll explain. Yeah, yeah. Right. But, uh, right. somebody got a tea, I can borrow for a second. I'll show you something. I have one. This is Hogan's uh, Hogan run. <coughs> can't, I can't use my wrist the way he would do it. Point is you can you can actually get your if you look at it here look at his left wrist. My left hand's turn, I don't have it like that. My left hand's turned over. If you look at my hands up here higher like this. Now when I go P1 to P2, this is flat. Look at the face. Look at the face. Perfectly square. Got it. Now watch. If I go like this, I set this up. Put this down here like this. See how bent that is? If I flatten that out right here at the back, so another the 
kind of shed it is. Now if I'm going to go CF out to the right, I can do this. I can set up with my hand down here real low. Got it? I can flatten this out in the back side like this. You got it? Because it goes inside. And if I go over like this and come a little over like this, then I get to go out through it all day long. Perfect. Yeah, if I'm going to go CP, my hands can get up. Because I'm going to get my hands up here because I want to keep that face more square, not closed. So when I take it back here like this, the face is there, and I just come right around and put it around like that. So you don't have this hole, you know. You see a lot of the guys, you see a hole yeah. here. You put uh, it with the longer on. ones. Oh, watch, watch. You, you can set up. See my left wrist here? Come yeah. here that's level right there. That's neutral. That's not uncut. That's uncut. Okay. All right. If I keep lowering it, now I'm starting to cut through this. Got it? It's like this. So, I mean, what do you do? Hogan had very long arms. Yeah. If Hogan put his arms directly under his shoulders, his shaft plane would have been down here like Rex Caldwell. Went down here like Hubert Green. So Hogan had to get his arms away from his body, higher up like this. That's why he did that. No, you yeah, uncock this to almost to the max, like Wayne, yeah. up Wayne Levy. Wayne Levy, look. <laughs> okay. Okay. If you get you, you get Hogan in here like this, right there, boom, you, you're coming almost right back to the exact same point. You can't have your left wrist like that. It's cocked. It's coming all the way down here like this. And it's gonna uncock like this. It's okay. But, but the other one. Is, no, I can, if I want to go CP, this is bent, I got to keep that bent all the way to the top. You got it? Yeah. And then I got to come all the way down here like this and try to keep that bent all the way to the top. That's hard to do. You can do it. You can do it. I can do it. Right. But for me, I mean, if, 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 you saw, if you saw me today, if I could hit the balls here, if my hands are higher to dress here like this, this is, my hands still turned over. You see, this is slightly bent here like this. Okay. See, look at the back of the left wrist. Like this. this that's flat. The higher you get this up, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. It's how flat you are. You guys are okay? Yeah, yeah. The higher you the more you start lowering, you start increasing. Got it? So the more you raise that up, look at it. It's how flat it is. So that's why a lot of guys, they come back straight to the impact here because if you're here it's almost like, you know your cup's got to be so flat well, what happens is the physics wants to throw the club up huh? so it's going to raise it anyway so it'll start to flatten out so the question is you can, you can actually sit up here like this sit up that way man i mean this is the best this is the best i've ever hit the golf ball ever ever i was saying this to everybody uh you know one month ago it's the best i ever hit the golf ball in my life ever ever I'm telling everybody I'm going to have to everybody. Now, I don't know if I'm going to play it. I, you know, I have these back problems. Okay, fine. I'll be okay. Now, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm ready to go. And I get all this stuff now. Stupid stuff. Okay. Uh, you want to hit one here?